Hello everyone. Um, welcome to the Metagame Book Club, Games and Psychology Track 1. And we have Sherry Jones with us. Um, Chris will not be joining us this evening as he is feeling under the weather. Um, that seems to be going around and and I just felt a little bit better so I, I got to to do the introduction today. So we're going to give it straight to Sherry now. Go ahead, tell us about week two. Thank you, Carrie. Um, so this is uh, week two for Games and Psychology, and the topic is a little bit long, but you'll see why. Narrative design and the psychology of emotions and immersion in games. It's a big mouthful of a lot of terminology. But I decided to put these two images in the front um, of the slides today just because they're so relevant, okay? The, the one on the left is the character Jody Holmes in a game called in uh, Beyond Two Souls. And this game is, there is a choice element to it. So it is a, it has a bit of interactive fiction element into that game. But the design of the characters, if it's not clear to you on the screen, she is crying. So they capture uh, very delicate emotions on the face of the character. And when this game came out, people felt like they could really relate to the character. Okay? So on the right-hand side, we have a game called Train. And that is a horror game where mannequins seems to move in the game. And <laughs> the reaction that you see there is from Markiplier, the Let's Play uh, player. You know, he's pretty popular. But anyway, this is how we're going to start today. So please go next. Okay, we got a lot of text. I'm going to briefly say, very quickly, um, I decided to cover briefly the book by uh, Katie Salen and Eric Zimmerman uh, called Rules of Play. That is another big game design book uh, that you should read. So, for example, we have the uh, Art of Game Design that's being covered in Track 2 by Jesse Shell. And the other big book that most game designers have, re have already read is this one. It's called Rules of Play and it was written in 2004. The second one is Rich, uh, Richard Le Marchand. This is actually another games developer conference uh, presentation. But he did such a good job in discussing the problem of immersion in the game design industry. So I decided to feature that text. The third text is another big one. It's one of those major texts talking about what is immersion. In fact, this concept, immersion, has been studied um, almost to death in academia. <laughs> so this is one of those seminary texts talking about immersion. Okay, so next. And it's slowly moving. And I think we might need a refresh. So hold on a second. And oh, I don't know if the slide is coming the slide is coming up or not. So hold on just a moment. Let me see if I oh here oh, there we you have go. it. But I'll be ready just in case is a backup. Okay. Thank you. Um three more texts really quick. Leonard Knack and Craig A. Lindley, they have their version of immersion, and they call that effective ludology. They analyze a first-person shooter and talking about what immersion is in that experience. The fifth one is psychology of immersion. Naturally, I have to talk about Jamie Madigan's uh, article. That was a pretty big one. Number six is game design psychology, and this actually came from a game designer, not a psychologist, but it's very interesting how he interpret what's going on in the layman version of psychology. Okay, so next. Okay, let me see if I can share mine. <laughs> Fun technical issues. Okay, no Hopefully problem. Comcast. Okay, mine might. What? Are, they might be. Mine might be coming into focus. How's that? That looks great. That looks okay. great. So three more text, and I'm almost done. This one's a fun one by Natalie Ward, um, and it's called "Massively Effective: um, Emotional Connections, Choice, and Humanity." Um, she is talking about Mass Effect. Okay, but she wanted to talk about how Mass Effect does such a good job connecting with players on an emotional level. 
Eighth one is another one by Madigan, recently published, is on the psychology of horror games. So there's lots of good stuff in that one. And the ninth one, ooh, this is controversial. It's about those nasty or wonderful microtransactions in current games such as Candy Crush Saga, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of games there. And this particular one talks about the feeling of envy. What is the association with envy and microtransactions? So those are all the text. So let's go next. Okay. We're going to talk about the immersion controversy in game design. Now let me preface this. First of all, the word immersion in game design is not the same, uh, it's not defined the same as how academics would define it. Because game designers are still trying to figure out what it is and academics have different lenses that they put on to interpret what that means. So I'm going to first talk about in the game design professional industry what the problem is with immersion. Okay, so next. Okay, introduction to this idea called the immersive fallacy. This is a term that was created by Salen and Zimmerman in their 2004 book, Rules of Play. And here's how they define it. They said, the immersive fallacy is the idea that the pleasure of a media experience lies in its ability to sensually transport the participant into an illusory, simulated reality. This reality is so complete that ideally the frame falls away so that the player truly believes that he or she is part of an imaginary world. If you looked at this definition, this should sound very familiar to you. In fact, most game people, people who play games, think that that's what immersion is, which is when you start playing a game, you forget everything about the outside world and you kind of fall into it. And game designers still talk about immersion in this sense. Okay, so they're saying that this is an error. So fallacy means an error. An immersive fallacy is an error in the way we think about immersion. Okay, so next. Okay, so they explain it this way, why it is a fallacy. They said, the danger with the immersive fallacy is that it misrepresents how play functions. And another... Uh, yellow text there on the bottom it says games create meaning for players as something separate from but not connected to the real world this is a key point that they pointed out which is a game is supposed to create a fictional version of the world it's not supposed to be a one-on-one -on -one simulation for them that's not really a game anymore that is where the simulation fallacy come from and the immersive fallacy or simulation fallacy. That came from when virtual reality was created and that language got carried into game design. So game designers constantly say immersion but basically Salen and Zimmerman said that this is really the wrong way to understand what games really do. So if we can go next. Oop. I think we have an issue with display today. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fun internet. Fun internet. So sorry. So um, next one is on the relationship between player and character. So specifically, the immersive fallacy would assert that a player has an immersive relationship with the character. That to play the character is to become the character. They say uh, that's not really true you don't really lose yourself completely um, as, uh, into the game and believe complete then that you are the game character. They also point out the, the error in that thinking. So we can go next and I'll explain why. Okay. Now they introduce this idea of double consciousness to explain why it is an error to think that when we get immersed in the game, we become the game character we play or we become part of that world. They said here, a player's relationship with a game character he or she directly controls is not a simple matter of direct identification. Instead, a player relates to a game character through the double consciousness of play. So what do they mean by this? Double consciousness means you are simultaneously 
conscious of the fictional world in a game, but you are still conscious of the reality that you exist in. So I decided to put this image on the right hand side to show you an example of a double consciousness. So the two characters, they're playing Outlast and there's a monster approaching them and one of them said, and it will loop around again, that we're invisible. If we turn off the camera then they, we can't see him and they, then he doesn't exist. So right, it's like putting a sheet over your head, right? So there's, <laughs> so their conversa conversation there, they're still remembering that there's a camera. Okay, they still remember a reality that they exist in while they're having a fun time discussing the horrific situation that they're in in Outlast. And Outlast is very, very scary. So most players freak out, but they're using this kind of conversation to make themselves relax a little bit. But that's an example where you have consciousness of uh, fictional world and consciousness of reality. So let's go next. Okay, now the double consciousness of character, so this is an emphasis now. A protagonist character is a persona through which a player exerts him or herself into an imaginary world. So they're explaining to you that your relationship with the character that you control, so that's what they mean by protagonist character, it's really just a persona, one of your many personas, okay? So that came from psychology, in fact, union psychology talk about persona all the time. But according to Jung, you can have many personas, not just one. So the way we think about a character inside a game, it's just one possible persona that we can take on. And then the second part is that the character is a tool, a puppet, an object for the player to manipulate according to the rules of the game. So some people uh, argue that a character in the game that you use is just a glorified mouse clicker. Basically the way you move your hands or maybe, you know, whether it's VR or you're using a PC game and you're using a mouse to control it, really a character is just a controller. <laughs> so there's two layers that the character functions. One is that it acts as your persona and the other it's it's a tool. It's a tool that allows you to open doors and unlock things and uh, go through levels and kill monsters. Okay, so go next. And, and I think when it comes to that, you see it a lot in, say, the difference between someone who plays an MMO like World of Warcraft, where you have you might have multiple characters. Mm -hmm. So there's not one that you just you know that that you might have one that you call your main, but you still have you identify with them, but you don't consider it you to be you. But then I'd say in the virtual world, Second Life, for a lot of people. Uh, at least educators who are first getting in there, they took their, char their, their character, their avatar very personally. Of course, yes, because, and that's a perfect example, because this idea of persona, persona, and I'll go way back into the definition, right? Persona are not fake things. They, they are one possible form of your personality. And for union psychology, we, are, we all have the potential to be evil, we all have the potential to be good, we all have the potential to be envious and so forth, okay? So a persona is basically the way you present yourself to the world and you present yourself in different ways to different people. So yes, naturally you should feel very personal toward that persona because it is a part of you. It is not a thing that's separate from you, okay? It's just a different expression of you. So that would be kind of an answer to why people get so attached to the game characters, as I do as well. Okay, um, and here's a problem with the meaning of immersion. So here's Richard Lamarchand, and he's actually the lead game designer of Naughty Dog. Naughty Dog, who famously created The Last of Us, you know, there's a very, very big game studio right now, and he reiterates this problem, which is he says, "Here they are, poor old immersion and immersive." Game design world have been using these words forever, right? And he says their relatives, <laughs> relative words, engaging and engagement are a bit better, but not much. We use these words all the time when we're talking about what makes game great, but do we really understand what they mean? Their literal sense seems confusing. When we're immersed in a game, what are we under the surface of? Are we inside the gameplay or the graphics, like James Wood making out with this creepy TV in David Cronenberg's film Videodrome? Now, before we go further, 
Notice that these terms, we also use them in education, like engage with the student, immerse the student in classes. But he's pointing out a very good point, which is these words are really abstract. They're not very specific. And when people use these words, they have their own version of what engagement means or what immersion means. So as a game designer, he is asking for a more specific definition because he doesn't understand what these words mean. So if we can go next. Okay, so last week we actually talked about the psychology of attention, okay, or attentional um, spotlight metaphor. As I lightly, breezily talked about it. The idea is that we have only so much attention that we can focus on in our environment one at a time because it has to do with the way our brain remember or retain memory. So if we don't focus at things one at a time, it's very hard for us to remember. Um, what's going on and it's also a revelation that our brain cannot pay attention to everything at the same time so even if you go to the same environment three four or five different times you might notice new things each time because you do not pay attention to every single element in that same environment because your brain is not capable of doing so so he's arguing this he says why don't we start looking at the psychology of attention instead of looking at immersion? Because immersion does not make sense to me, right? And he says, video games entrance us by getting our attention. And then they give us what we call a compelling experience by holding our attention. Loosely defined as the co uh, cognitive process of paying attention to one aspect of the environment while ignoring others, attention is one of the most widely studied and discussed subjects in the whole of psychology. So this was in 2012. So this, when he presented this idea, this was still pretty um, revolutionary to talk about um, attention rather than immersion during his speech. So we can go next. Okay. <laughs> now we're going to talk about the psychology of vigilance. Vigilance is just another word to say uh, concentration. Okay. And he says this. This is a very good point. We now know that that's not quite true, that we can only attend to one thing at once. Our unconscious minds are always monitoring the world for the arrival of important information. We call this vigilance. So this has to do with this idea of multitasking, where we're kind of noticing multiple things at the same time. That doesn't mean, though, when we multitask that we can retain memory better, because a lot of research shows that when you multitask, you don't do each thing as well as in comparison to if you do just that one thing but we do have the ability to pay attention to multiple things okay and it has been studied a lot since 1940s because vigilance has to do with uh, all kinds of career paths like you know traffic control military surveillance lifeguarding and so forth because you require those people in those positions to pay attention to important things not everything that's in their environment so when you train for example a traffic controller they have to notice you know what's happening on the on the track when the plane is coming they have to know what is time and some specific things they're not going to focus on other things for example there's a bird outside or there's a bug they usually ignore <laughs> those things focusing on what's important so that's what vigilance is and this has a lot of relevance to game design okay so we can go next okay there are two types of attention that he brought up okay first I'm going to talk about reflexive attention so reflexive attention is reflex you're paying attention to something that just you know that caught your attention so he says example sudden loud sounds and emotion and motion have the same effect as to the mention of your name anything that threatens your survival and just plain novelty anything new and different this is called reflexive attention so if someone threw a ball toward your direction you might turn around and start looking at that ball that is just your reflex that's the reflexive attention so let's go next the second type is called voluntary attention okay it has to do with um, executive attention so in the sense that executive attention is the way we make decisions, the way our brain pay attention and make decisions on what to do or what to focus on. So he um, defined it as also problem solving and the way we monitor our own actions. So that is what we call voluntary attention. And he also pointed out that this is what we're talking about whenever we talk about agency. 
But it seems that we rarely talk about what the player is choosing to pay attention to. So there's another word, right? Giving players agency. We talk about that too in education, giving students agency. But he said it's not agency doesn't just come and magically appear. What is happening is that the player or the learner is making a decision on what they want to pay attention to. Now, he says, that is what we should define agency as. But most people don't define it that way. Okay, so next. Okay, now I just covered briefly, and I know I talked a lot already, but I covered <laughs> briefly <laughs> game design world, okay, what immersion means in game design world. Now I'm going to take you into academia, which is a lot more complex than what I just covered, okay, so let's go next. All right, psychophysiology and three levels of immersion. Quickly, psychophysiology. Psychophysiology is the study of relationship between mind and body. So when you do certain bodily functions, there we study how your body function affects your psychological state. So you study both at the same time. That's called psychophysiology. And now, Ermi and uh, uh, Mara wrote a paper called Analyzing Immersion 2005 and they referenced Brown and Carnes because Brown and Carnes first tried to attempt to explain what exactly is immersion and they came up with three classifications to help us understand what's going on in immersion. They, uh, it ranges from engagement to engrossment and then total immersion. Right, so those are the three levels. Um, engrossment meaning you're starting to get into immersion, and total immersion is you're totally lost in the activity that you're doing. But for Ermi and Mara, this is not quite enough because it doesn't really explain exactly qualitatively how these three classifications um, is uh, defined. You know, they're saying, well, it's kind of these these levels are not clearly defined here, and I don't know how we can say that's engrossment versus that's engagement. Okay, and they also say that in the context of digital game, flow-like phenomenon seem only to be fleeting experiences, which in turn suggests that they are something different from flow as traditionally conceived. So they're even arguing a big thing, which is, you know, when we talk about game. Uh, immersion. Game immersion is more fleeting than the way flow was discussed by Chicks and Mihai. Okay, Chicks and Mihai's version of flow has more sustainability and it has longer time period. But for Mara and and Ermi, they're saying, wait a second, flow it takes games are not exactly flow. They don't have sustainability as long as you know the way that uh, Chicks and Mihai envision flow. So they decided to call game flow as micro flow or, or game flow. Okay, so this there's the distinction. So next. Okay, now after they cover Brown and Carnes, they decided to present their own model and this is the famous SCI model. Um, SCI models um, stands for the three words that you're about to see. Sensory immersion, challenge-based immersion and imaginative immersion, SCI, okay? Sensory immersion is when you are attracted to what you're doing based on the audio-visual input. So for games, you know, very easily games can draw you into that, especially if it's graphically intense or auditorily intense, sensory immersion. Challenge-based immersion is a little bit different, which is it has to do with the interaction um, regarding challenge and abilities, right? The balance between challenge and abilities. And this one you'll start to hear that there's that connection with flow. And the third type of immersion is imaginative immersion, which has to do with storyline, okay? And they call it, we call this a dimension of gameplay in which one becomes absorbed with the stories in the world or begins to feel for or identify with a game character. So they define that as imaginative immersion when you feel like you're part of that world. So this these are bigger classification now. So let's go next. Okay. So Leonard Naki and Craigley A. Lindley pointed out, and this is what they said, is that they think that in the SCI model, that challenge-based immersion, it's very close to Chicks and Mihai's description of flow experience. They don't necessarily see a distinction between flow and microflow because they're not, 
for myself as I'm looking at various research, Csikszentmihalyi never said that flow has to be about a certain time period. He never gave us a specific quantitative measure of what exactly constitutes a flow experience. So there is this differentiation in microflow or flow, but again, there's still controversy regarding that. Okay, but for for Naki and Lindley, they see that the challenge-based immersion with the challenge versus a skill is the closest to flow that we're talking about. And lastly, really quick, challenges in this definition can include different mixtures of physical and mental performance uh, requirements. So again, they want to talk about how the mind and the body interact produces flow. It's not just here or it's not just the physical, but both interacting. So you can see that on the right hand side, that's the cat <laughs> playing whack-a-mole, but it's yeah. very... <laughs> It's very, it's very entranced. That's the cat's flow state right now that you're seeing. Okay, so let's go next. Okay, so I showed you that cat example because the cat noticed that the cat was pouncing around. It's skill based, right? So it's entranced because it's skill and a challenge. The challenge is trying to poke the fingers down, and it's trying to use a skill with a paw to pounce it down. So that would be that challenge. Now, some psychologists say, wait a second. This word immersion sure sounds like presence. In fact, this word presence has been studied for, for decades and decades in the psychology field. And they say, oh, that's just another term that the game designers are using to describe something we've been studying for years. Okay, So here's the definition. The concept of presence can be discussed briefly in relation to immersion, but it is often defined as a state of mind of being transferred to an often virtual location rather than a gradually, uh, gradual, timely experience. So presence specifically is, they're talking about state of mind as in transporting yourself. So you could be technically sitting somewhere, but you all of a sudden transport yourself mentally through your experience in Paris. Let's say you stayed on vacation in, in Paris for, for several months and you're sitting in Colorado, let's say, and all of a sudden your mind drifts and start thinking about Paris and imagine that you're at that cafe. That has to do with the, the study on presence. Okay, But also presence doesn't have that gradual, timely experience where um, flow has more of that timely, timely experience element to it. So what Naki and Lindley decided to argue is that we should really look at spatial presence. Okay, Spatial presence has to do with, and I'll define it again, <laughs> two-dimensional construct in which the core dimension is the sensation of a physical location in a virtual spatial environment, and the second dimension depicts perceived action possibilities. So not only are you thinking about a location virtually here, but also you're thinking about actions that you can do. So that is closer for them a flow state because you're doing you're using your mind and you're using your body, right? And that's how they define it as spatial pr uh, presence. Okay. So next. All right. So that was a lot, right? Now we got another <laughs> Told you, immersion is a is a big controversy. Here's a third version, okay? And this is by Madigan. So Madigan went to Worth and All's theory. So he brought up another theory here. He says that spatial presence he believes happens this way in three steps. So one is the players form a representation in their minds of the space and world with which the game is presenting them. So that means as I have said in previous um, uh, presentations, that if you can mentally reconstruct the model of the game world in your head, that's the entryway into immersion. Okay. Second step is that when the players begin to favor the media-based space, which is the game world, as their point of reference for where they are. So put it in psychologically gobbledygook, <laughs> that's what Atticus says, their primary ego reference frame. So your ego reference, that's, there's a lot of terminology. I'm not going to go into every single thing like what ego is and everything. But primarily, let's say it's your primary persona, if you will, okay? If you want to think of it this way, where you feel that currently you're in. So for, if you're sitting like myself, I'm sitting at uh, my office, okay? But I'm currently feeling like I'm part of the Metagame Book Club. I'm actually mm -hmm. in this virtual space with everybody. So this will be my primary ego reference frame. 
Okay? And then he just says profit because who knows what happens afterwards. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was going to ask about the profit one. South, South Park. There's a nice little South Park reference, right? The underwear gnomes. Anyone remember that? No? <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. But here's the main point is he thinks that that's exactly how immersion works. So besides all the categorization of what are the, the series of immersion, he says, look, all that is confusing, but if you just understand that, first of all, it has to have a mental model. If your brain can construct a mental model, that's when you start leaping in. Okay? So let's go next. Okay. And he also says here, players forming a mental model of the game's make belief space by looking at various cues. So the game cues, for example, images, movements, sounds, and so forth, as well as assumptions of the world that they may bring to the table. He also emphasized this, which is this process, immersion, can be a subconscious thing, on the slide slipping into sideways and entered and exited constantly. So he doesn't think that you are you don't have to necessarily be conscious and say, I'm going to go into immersion. Really, he's saying majority of the time we go into immersion without realizing that we're doing that. And again, just to remind you, in psychological terminology, it really is called spatial presence, okay? Mind with physical body moving at the same time. So next, going next. Okay, now we're going to talk about emotion. So... Boy, we just went over immersion. That was a big, <laughs> big, a lot of, <laughs> sure, people are going to have a lot of questions even after I cover that. Now, this poor guy was playing a horror game, and this is purely someone filming him, looking at his reaction, and the guy was truly horrified. And notice this, right? You're not actually in a horrific environment, but games have that ability to make us feel existential fear, right? Oh my God, this thing's about to come at me. You know there's a screen in front of you, but yet you fall into the illusion that you're about to get killed, right? So that's what we're going to go into. So I'm going to first talk about what game designers are thinking and how emotions work in game design, okay? So next. Okay. Now, this is pretty special. This is... Hirokazu Yasuhara, and Hirokazu Yasuhara is the level designer of the famous, famous level designer of Sonic the Hedgehog, okay, the famous Sonic mm -hmm. the Hedgehog. He also, I think he has worked for Naughty Dog, and he has a lot of different projects under his belt, okay. But this is an interview that he gave to Game of Sutra in 2008, and he said the following things. He says, this is something that I think is vital for any interactive experience. That sort of proactive desire in motion. This manifests itself in a lot of ways. The player can satisfy this desire a lot of ways in a lot of different games. But there's something else involved here. Creation. Some people get what they want via destruction, but others do it via creation instead. So for players, why they want to play, he thinks that some people like to do creation, some people like to do destruction, but primarily it's because we want to do something. The motion is involved in games. This is why we want to do either or. And he also says, by the same token, some people think in the opposite way. If I kill every enemy in the area, then that logical me logically means I'll be more secure. Fear at play. It's different ways of arriving at the same emotion. Okay, so he is saying also some people argue it's not because I just want to move or do something, right? But the idea is that they're using logic to say this is the best strategy for me to win at the game, even if it's not true. This is how players think. And he thinks that our fears are driving our, de uh, our decisions in the way we play games. So next. Okay, also he says, oh, this is controversial. Well, maybe it's not. <laughs> Maybe it's not. I think that Kay and Chris can, can uh, <laughs> agree with this one. <laughs> he, you know, some people say second life. It's a game. He says, uh, n no, no. Games don't give you total freedom. That's, that's not a game, okay? That doesn't make, even make sense. So he says, second life, they say you can do anything you want, but really there's nothing to do there. That, that's not a game. In a game, the designer is a game master, and he has to be thinking about you. Okay. There is a difference between making a game and making a virtual world and, um, world and putting it in a package. It's the job of the game master to take that world and give you the motivation to move through it. If you don't, then that won't leave the player satisfied. 
notice the terminology that he's using. He's not really talking about psychology of motivation yet, but certainly he's using those words to tell you, look, a game is like a puzzle box, okay? You have to design certain things to make the player feel motivated to go solve that puzzle. And obviously, game gives you constraints. If it's just a free world where you're just running around randomly, that's really not a game. So that was just a little beef, okay, on how we need to restrict <laughs> freedom while giving the player a sense of freedom as well. So that's something about game design regarding feelings. Okay, next. Yeah. And oh, I was ahead. just going to say that I, I think that, that what he's saying is absolutely right. That was the that was their tagline. You can do anything you want, and, but there's really nothing to do there. Well, it's 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 a bunch of amateurs create you know like creating a nice landscape or 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 building something beautiful, and that and that fits some people, but not everyone, and. Gamers go in and find that they are bored because there's so little to do. Now, Minecraft seems to get seems to be able to balance that just a little bit better. You know, right. survival mode, PvP mode. You know, um, versus, well, there's, versus there's the spiders, board. right? There's spiders yeah. and monsters. Yeah, and... exactly. Versing, you know, just just plain creative mode there. So Minecraft has ba has balanced that to give you things to do. But again, people go from Minecraft server to Minecraft server looking for ones that are fun and have things to do and have mm -hmm. people who are doing things there. Mm -hmm. And yes, so <laughs> I, I would have I, w I would have to say that he he discusses it he discusses it very well. The yes. Differences between a game and and a virtual world like Second Life. This is our choice quote. This is very well explained. I agree with you. So we just talked about the game designers, how they think emotions work, right? Now I'm going to take you to the dark, dark place of academia. No. <laughs> 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 when we talk about complex stuff. So they're thinking, how exactly does emotion actually work? So we're going to talk about the academic version of how they think. Now, what you see in front of you it's one of my favorite games, okay? This is the game The Last of Us, and that is actually a game by Naughty Dog. And the two characters, on the left, that's Ellie, okay? And on the right, it's actually Ellie and Joel. And, and you'll see that the emotion of the characters, because they're so well made and so intricate, you can actually read their emotional state on their face because the game is that uh, high high fidelity okay and on the right hand side it's actually a really sad thing I might be giving it away but that's toward the ending so anyway I'm not gonna say more <laughs> so let's go next <laughs> okay emotions and character design this is by Natalie Ward and she is she wanted to write a paper discussing exactly how mass massive mass effect massive effect mass effect does such a great job making players care about their characters how the game make you care about the storyline okay so she says most characters in this game do look like they are paying attention when you are speaking to them Aha, uh -huh. see, the word attention came up again. But she's not saying for us to pay attention to the game. She's saying the game character is paying attention to us. Okay, so that's interesting. Some of this is attributable to the game design showing characters up close to the screen from the shoulders up, so when you are conversing, so that you can watch the reaction of your audience in a more realistic fashion. So the character, even the, the view that you have, the full body view versus the upper view versus the half body view that actually affect the way you feel emotionally toward that character. So she pointed out these interesting ideas. Okay, so keep going next. Okay, she also point out um, interestingly, um, and actually. This has been studied for a very long time in psychology as well, but this is what she points out. There are six basic facial expression categories that have been shown to be recognizable across cultures. Uh, so if you ask me, well, is this really true? Y yes, but there's still controversy. They're saying, well, are they really truly six facial expressions that are shared across all cultures in the world? And there's been research backing that up where, um, and I, I won't go into the, that particular research, but the point is that the six, six uh, expressions are discussed 
fear, joy, surprise, sadness, and anger. That means if you see someone's face and you can usually say, oh, that's disgust, or they're afraid, or they're happy, and so forth. So there are some shared facial expressions, okay? And then she also emphasizes that beyond these six expressions, there are also nonverbal displays, including eyebrow flash, yawning, startle, coy display, and embarrassment and shame. What she is doing here is trying to point out those elements that can help game designers understand how do you design facial expressions that mimic those particular elements. And there's been expensive pictures, photographs taken of subjects that are looking like they're scared and looking like they're surprised. So many game designers actually take from those photographs to design game characters. She also finally argues that knowing the role of emotional expression, it is interesting to note that in Mass Effect, regardless of the fact that it is an entirely new galaxy with a number of different species, almost all characters are capable of human-like facial expressions. So funny enough, we don't notice this, right? But if the game has aliens or monsters, they still have those facial expressions that we recognize. That's because game designers realize we can't relate to a character if they don't look kind of human, anthropomorphized, right? There's some human elements. And in order for us to want to feel emotionally connected to a character, the face of the, the monsters or, or aliens have to look or mimic our facial expressions. So she's basically revealing some, some uh, truth of game design here. So next. Okay, so this this is my this is one of my favorite horror games lately. I'm very sad that Konami decided not to continue creating this game, but this is actually Silent Hill. And what you're seeing before you is the first screenshot that you will see if you open up Silent Hill, okay, in the PlayStation. <laughs> and it's a psychology <laughs> warning. This video game psychologically profiles you as you play. It gets to know who you really are, then uses this information to change itself. It uses its knowledge against you, creating your own personal nightmare. This game plays you as much as you play it. If, if you joined us in our last webinar, okay, and where we interviewed um, Ross Moreno, he has a game where in the interactive fiction game, you are choosing your psychological profile and the game changes based on how you create your profile. This technique is now starting to be used in a lot of different games. And Silent Hill is one of the games that employs it very, very well. It will scare the heck out of you because they start <laughs> to understand what scares you. Okay, so this technique is happening now. So if we can go next. Okay, Madigan, try to address why people like to play horror games. So let's, let's start from there, okay? He says, researchers say some people just have the right kind of personality for appreciating scares because they're sensation seekers attracted to any emotional high, be it from skydiving, shark, shark punching, punching. <laughs> <laughs> or, or horror games or horror films. Other personalities are drawn to situations showing social norms being broken in ways that will probably never happen in real life. Now, what I just read really quickly for you, remember what we discussed in week one, the idea of game addiction. Game addiction doesn't happen to everybody. There's been argument that you have to have a certain type of personality to get addicted to games. Now, this conversation also extends to other studies, which is, do everyone get scared by the same things? They said, well, it kind of depends on your personality. What scares you might be different for somebody else, right? And then he says, but perhaps a more encompassing explanation of horror's inherent appeal is how it helps us master our fears. So he's saying, maybe some of us like to watch horror games or, or horror films or play play those games. It's because we want to conquer the fear that we have about certain things. So for us, it's a challenge we want to take on to make ourselves psychologically stronger. Okay? And Andrew Weaver, who um, uh, was also a designer here, he says, we can experience an adverse event through film, and we know that it will end, will survive it, and will go on with our lives, right? That's the thing is, if you're in a horror game, once you play it, you can jump out of it. You feel safe. So there is this word, safety, safe, in game design world, because a game gives you a safe experience to experiment. In other situations, I mean, I think 
we're 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 probably in more danger if we go into a Halloween horror house, right? <laughs> We're getting chased by chainsaws or people trying to scare us. I am more terrified of those horror, scary houses than if I were to play a horror game. Okay, because I know I can jump out of that easily. Next. Okay, now I'm introducing this this term, excitation transfer theory. Ooh, sounds sounds big, but it's actually <laughs> <laughs> pretty easy to understand. Um, research on excitation transfer has shown that vague feelings of excitement or anticipation can transfer their emotional wallop when monsters or killers eventually barge onto the scene. This is why ambient noises and spooky soundtracks are so effective. That means we have our excitement or something builds up, okay, and finally it culminates into a big scare. So what game designers do is they play music, you know, to slowly give mm -hmm. players some cues, right? Okay, something bad is about to happen, or some kind of visual cue. So when something does actually jump out, that's why it's so darn scary, because they know that scare has to do with this buildup. This is why excitation transfer works. It's the slow buildup, and then all of a sudden, there's the object of horror, and you get really, really horrified. Okay. <laughs> I also included the second part just because it's a fun little discussion here. Okay, John Williamson, designer on Saw 2, flesh and blood video game, he's complaining about the problem of trying to put ga music into games because he says, we are required by Microsoft and Sony to allow the player to turn the music tracks off and replace it with Backstreet Boys or other music of their choice. <laughs> Spielberg doesn't have to contend with that. Would Jaws be as scary if you were listening to I Want It That Way instead of John Williams' <laughs> hunting shark thing? And that's a problem, right? But again, it was with uh, player choice. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, I don't know if the games... I don't even know if WoW allows you to. Can can you turn off sound effects? Oh yeah, you you can you can turn off uh, that. Uh, you can turn off the sound effects. You can turn off the dialogue. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. N it's it's no problem. Some pe some people do it so that they can concentrate more on the gameplay, but then other other people leave it up because they need the audio cues to let them <laughs> to let them know things like like yes, yeah, the next big monster is going to come in. Right. So, do you think that this rant is? Um, oh, he's he's he's, he's right about it. I agree. Jaws Jaws would be <laughs> different to the Backstreet Boys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think he's I think he's right about that. But I, I what I would say is what you've said about art before, you know. Yeah. And how how now art is when you experience it the way the artist wants you to experience it. And and but this, you know, the, this game designer, he's selling a consumer product. And you know, the the consumer, you know, it, they can turn the you know they can turn the audio off or down if they want to and they can play the Backstreet Boys to Jaws if they feel it if they feel like it. Well, here's the thing, right? This is interesting as a discussion because films are consumer products. Mm -hmm. So are we? I mean, can you envision in the future? I mean, I don't even know if films are going to be around <laughs> as long as video games. <laughs> Look, are we going to be like, okay, I'm going to go into the theater, but on my side, I, I'm going to turn the sound down because I just want to look at the dialogue. I wonder if it's going to go there because in the in game players demand a lot of things from game designers. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if the film industry is going to kill or if it's just going to be, we dominate your experience because that's how we want you to feel about the movie. That's... Well, I think it's a market. De I think it's it's absolutely a market decision. The film industry has decided we're going to dominate your experience because, well, we we want you to leaving with having a certain kind of feeling. While the while the you know the publishers of the games are making a decision. Well, we we want to sell to sell it, but we want you to have choices. So we're going to so we're going to allow you to make these choices. So I think these are these are market decisions. Mm. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for that. Let's go next from here. Okay, there's a little more. There's a little more about this, okay? Excitation transfer theory has also been hypothesized to give us a kind of thank God that's over high. So 
I think this has to do also with people who like to skydive um, or do dangerous activities like like uh, you know skateboarding, roller um, coasters, roller coasters. Exactly, right? You know, you know that's that's an easy, not so dangerous one. You know, it's a very <laughs> it's, it's a very short ride. You yell, you yell, scream, you get scared, and then it's over. Right. Right. Exactly. And and um, for uh, what Madigan point out here from from Glenn Sparks actually, that specifically there is a positive emotion that you feel after you get scared. Scared. So what we're being high to the drug that we're going after is the the afterwards. After we got scared, then we feel oh it's over. Now I feel really good. For some people, it's actually like a drug to to see horror things. Uh, and that poor girl is playing Oculus Rift. She's she's horrified. <laughs> well, well that, that's that's the thing of it because we just did, and uh, we just did the virtual reality at the WCET conference. Mm -hmm. We saw a lot of, and and Ross mentioned this also with his game. We put um, we didn't have the Oculus Rift. We had the Samsung. Um, viewer instead, yeah. but we saw that people who we knew to be gamers, when they put it on, they they did not have a react that much of a reaction to it. People who were not gamers had a larger reaction because we were even put in a scenario where you were in a wheel where you were in a wheelchair and <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and 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 it looked kind of like an insane asylum and you were kind of strapped and. <laughs> and our our people who were gamers really didn't have a reaction to it, while the people who weren't gamers who didn't you know, in you know do, they didn't go into a game as any kind of character. Right. They they reacted quickly to it. Hmm. You know, I think I really think as the, the, the reaction because I was thinking about this problem since our last conversation. I still could think it's related to attention. Because games successfully train, this is why mm -hmm. educators and um, psych, uh, researchers are so interested in games because they feel that games can train players to be better focused on paying attention to important things, okay, to pay attention to things. Whereas I remember Ross uh, saying this, I mentioned this, is that when you have someone who is not a gamer who strap on, you know, Oculus Rift, and was playing inside their game, they look all around with their camera, right? They don't know what to look for, and they're freaking yeah. out. That's because they don't know what to pay attention to. They're looking all over for the environment. Where's the gamer go? Wait, I need to pay attention to clues now. What is the <laughs> next thing I got to do? Is there an arrow? Is there some shiny thing? So we are trained to pay attention to what's going on. In fact, you know, the, the military right now is seeing a lot of video games to train soldiers to pay attention to the right thing. That's why I think this Oculus Rift business, or even with the Samsung viewer, this idea that gamers already kind of know what to expect because they are trained to pay attention to what's necessary rather than freak out about this over um, uh, over stimulation of too much environmental stimuli, right? So I think there's that connection there too. So um, next. Um, lastly, this is... And before we get turned off by this, I, I do want to say this. <laughs> this one's going to sound sexist, and even Madigan, you know, admits uh. this. Social benefits of enduring horror, you know. For males in particular, sitting through these films is sort of a test, right? It proves to oneself, and more importantly to Pierce, that one is man enough to handle it. Now, the other one is that, and I think that was going to be the next part, but the idea is that guys do it because it's like the initiation like ah you know I'm stronger than you are I can deal with the horror and in evolutionary theory right the, through um, evolution um, theory we think that the reason why we are looking for horror is because it reminds us on how to survive because in the wild if there's a tiger that's coming towards you you need to get scared and you need to know when to run <laughs> So as we are becoming, you know, urban animals rather than being close to the jungle, we need something else to fulfill that need to get scared, to remind ourselves that we need to survive, 
and act quickly. So some evolutionary uh, theorists believe that this is why we get scared. But this is why you see different disciplines have different answers for why we get scared. Um, and oh yeah, societal norm. This is this is the part that's a little controversial. Yeah. So societal norms. Remember, he is saying that society sometimes conditions us, right, to think what exactly does it mean to be a male and what exact, exactly does it mean to be a female. So Madigan theorizes that perhaps the way we are acting, you know, when we play horror games, as in girls get scared and they scream, and the guy had to come and protect them, is because they're playing out the societal norms that's placed on us. So he's not saying inherently girls are supposed to be protected, right? And guys are supposed to be the protector. He is saying that people play out these, these stereotypes when they're playing horror games, and they like it because it helps them relive those societal norms. As in, I am doing the right thing. Because societal norm is also, there's an ethical component to it, which is, this is the right way I should behave. So when I behave through a horror game, I feel like I'm doing the right thing as a real uh, following society social citizen. Okay, so that's the controversy, but I don't want people to think reading that that automatically they're thinking, oh, that's how girls are supposed to behave. No, it's some girls like to play the stereotypes. That's what we're talking about. Okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, let me emphasize one more time. I kind of explained it already. The, the, that last one we discussed, he calls it the snuggle theory of horror. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it sounds sexist, right? But here's the, the study that he referenced. He says, a famous study supports the snuggle theory horror by showing that men who were paired for the viewing of Friday the 13th, part 3, with women who pretended to be afraid, were more likely to say they enjoyed the movie and were attracted to their viewing partner than were men who watched the horror film with women displaying mastery of their fear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, come on. We, we both know there's variables in there that, that aren't being discussed at the moment. Right, right. But certainly he's just saying this is a study. He's the man against the thing. I did the study. He's saying there, there's some study yes, that says... Yes, I know. <laughs> I, I, would, I, would go, I would go the snuggle theory just works in general. You know? <laughs> right. Just, just in general. So yeah. he does say... <laughs> He does say, see, individual results may vary. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that that theory might work in a com watching a comedy film, <laughs> watching, you know, a right. period piece. I don't right. know. But I, I think a good point to remember, too, is how much do the person we're talking about, or persons that we're referencing, how much do they conform to norms? Some of us are against norms, you know, so when we watch it, we might not be acting out the way society expects us to, but Madigan is really saying, well, some people like to, uh, you know, follow norms, therefore, you know, they behave in such ways. So there is some, I mean, they, they, I think there's some credence to this idea, um, and we know that we meet students, you know, that, that, that act in a certain way because they believe this is the way students need to behave. Like, for example, some student called me Sherry by my first name, while some student called me Teacher. <laughs> and I go, wait, you can call me Sherry, that's okay, or Miss Jones, but they go, Teacher, Teacher, you know, or Professor. Whatever that makes them comfortable, I don't really challenge it. So they have to play throughout their societal roles, and this is what he is really saying, okay? So next. All right, we're almost going to the end, promise. Psychology of envy and microtransaction. <laughs> <laughs> this is a nice one. Yay. Let's go next. Okay. Quickly for, for us who, I think most of us know what they are already, but let me just mm -hmm. briefly explain what it is. Microtransactions are usually low-cost expansions for existing games. These expansions can range from either buying a new content for a game um, or buying in-game extras, right? It has been estimated that in 2007 alone, a profit of $2.1 billion, oh boy, mm -hmm. was made purely on the sales of in-game items for real money, okay? That's a lot of money people are spending on buying in-game items. I mean, to upgrade your weapon or buying new armor, I mean, that is what we mean by those little microtransactions, which is... This kind of stuff doesn't really happen if you pay for a game upfront. So there's a cost. Let's say the game is $50, $60. Uh, 
you usually don't pay as much for microtransactions. But it's those other games, which is the free for play or free to play mm -hmm. games, which is they're so cost upfront. But then all of a sudden, when the challenge gets really tough, you go, wait, I need to buy this magic mushroom to make myself bigger so I can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, yeah, microtransactions. Now, or cash for currency in game. Right, exactly. Right. So, Briefly, as Chris reminds us, it's really just you're changing your cash into currency for the in game play. That's microtransaction. Okay, so next. Okay, now, this is interesting. They're taking a very old um, um, argument here, but they're applying it to what's happening in game. Okay, so Festinger in 1954 argued that people are motivated to form accurate impressions of themselves and do so by comparing themselves to others. So that's the comparison theory, which is this is who I am because I'm better than that other person. So we compare ourselves against our peers to make ourselves to judge our value who we are in society, okay? That's Festinger. So in other words, to evaluate one's performance, people look to others and evaluate how they rank compared to them. If people do better than others, they feel good about themselves. And if other people are better off, then they can feel more negative and more frustrated, right? So some people have low self-esteem or they get angry at themselves because they look at their peers as evaluation of who they are as a person. So next. Okay, when a player um, of an online computer game uses microtransaction to buy an in-game advantage, this can effectively make the player better off than others. I think this is obvious. I think yeah. this is obvious. <laughs> but come on, you, you you're wearing Prada and I'm wearing knockoff. I mean, it. Oh my gosh! You right? know that that could make <laughs> me feel bad, or or I might have rationalized it enough to to say that I'm better off because I'm not spending the money and and I'm still getting the functionality, you know. Right, right. But you know what's you know even if it seems this obvious, right? Like, well, duh, that's why we're competing with each other. What, <laughs> yes. <laughs> what the study is trying to do, which I think is great, it's really wonderful, it's the Evers, Venn, and Weta, is that they're trying to say that when you're designing that, how do we, how do we harness envy, this feeling of envy, to make <laughs> games better? Because a lot of people, you know, um, in um, a podcast, Evers was saying that you know most people associate negative evaluation with envy, but as our discussion shows, we do this anyway. Naturally, in society, we try to evaluate ourselves against other people. That's how envy works. So, how do we employ this envy, this feeling of envy, to make games better? He doesn't necessarily think it's such a bad thing. Okay. So next. Oh, and that that was it. I I actually went through <laughs> on time. I was going very fast today. Um, yeah. And and I, what I have to say is because on on the other track we were looking at the manifesto from Electronic Arts that yeah. got put out in the 80s about can a computer make you cry? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll be pulling some of your uh, some of your slides and referencing it back to that to that discussion question because it it re it really does. Um, Hit on that because in the book you uh, they they start discussing they start discussing that they don't go in depth. Um, you is much more about this is how a, a game studio was run a fictional game studio was run like Circuit 1999. But there's still a lot from there from here that shows up in that book. And the problem is they try to ignore they try to ignore narratives. In the book, and they talk about do, can we get away with not developing the story anymore? Can we get away with not developing the characters right. and, and things like that? But this will work well because um, in the last section of the book, they talk about one of their franchises, which is um, it's kind of the equivalent of like film noir, like a, a spy thriller thing, and they really and and how the emotion and the feel was different. From what they had done, with which was the usual like sword and board, regular kind of D Dungeons and Dragons, only done digitally. Right, 
Ah, perfect, perfect. I know we somehow magically start talking about emotions this week. Weird. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> No, it worked it worked really well. Um <laughs> as far as the the academic part of it, yeah. but think about language training and and what the term immersion means in language training. Yeah. What and I hope that this last part with emotion though particularly shows that it, the character design is really really important. The story design is very, very important because that's how we relate to the game. Emotion doesn't just come out of nowhere. I mean, you could do, you can do cheap jump scares, right? So like Slender Man, you know, all of a sudden, oh, there's a surprise. Ooh, whoopie doo, you know. But there's only so much you can do. People, people go, okay, I'm kind of tired of, I'm kind of tired of this jump scare. And there's a lot of horror games like that that mm-hmm. operate on those simple principles. But any case, yeah, there's. Yeah, there's there's a lot to be explored. I just want to la- leave one thing though. I have a lot of articles this week. I really, really cover very few, and each of the articles that I cover with you today, um, I briefly discuss very small parts of those articles. So with this overview, please feel free to read those articles in depth. I certainly don't want you to misunderstand each theory's position because their position is a lot more complex than what I can cover in an hour. So definitely try to read some of those articles if you're interested. Okay. Yeah, and we're going to say Happy Thanksgiving week to everybody in the U.S. and um, We won't be putting up anything new this week because we're going to kind of give people a week off and then you'll see things at the beginning of next week. So thank you everybody and goodbye. Bye.